This exact sales process has made my agency over a million dollars and today I'm going to break it down all the way from our first outreach message, our follow-ups, our appointment setting, and even our proposal process. So let's get into it. If you don't know who I am, my name is Michael and for the last 10 years I have been building marketing agencies. My current agency, Done For You Meetings, helps B2B companies book more appointments with cold email and this exact sales framework is what we use to make ourselves more than a million dollars in revenue as well as our clients. So I'm going to break it down part by part for you today. We're going to start with the initial outreach strategy, so how we're segmenting our audience and the exact sequencing we're using to reach them. Next, we're going to go over how I have an omni-channel touchpoint with LinkedIn to gain the prospect's trust. Then we're going to go through appointment setting. How do I actually get a prospect onto an appointment and what do I do if they ignore me? Now that we have the meeting scheduled, I want to talk about how we reinforce our authority with retargeting ads, how we convert the most booking link clicks to calls by optimizing our calendar form, how we deal with no-shows, how we build up proposals, and to sum it up, I'll give you a few extra tips that have worked for us with this process. Starting with outbound messaging. Outbound messaging is the main way my company books meetings. Now, our primary outbound channel and the one we offer to clients as a service is cold email. Now, I do also do some lumpy mail, which is physically sending people packages as well as Upwork applications and LinkedIn messaging. But for this video, I'm gonna focus on cold email as it's what I'm best at and what I recommend for most people. So when I run campaigns for myself or my clients, I always run two types of campaigns. One is going to be a very large, broad campaign and the other a smaller, segmented campaign. The broad campaign's goal is to run forever. Even when I have a busy week, a bad week, when I'm taking on a lot of clients or anything else goes on in life, my broad campaign is still running. It's not gonna get the same level of results as my segmented campaign when considering percentage conversion, but it may drive more leads just out of sheer volume. Now, my segmented campaign is gonna be broken down into smaller sub-campaigns that have very high relevance to the audience I'm reaching out to. So let's talk more about both. Starting with my segmented campaign. For my segmented campaign, I'm looking to build unique lists that tell me more about my prospects and allow my messaging to be more relevant to them. These generally fall into a few categories. We have trigger, indicator, title specific, case study specific, personal connection, and lead source specific. I'm gonna go through and give a quick example on each. Starting with trigger, a trigger is when a company takes a certain action, which tells us we can message them and use that action as context. For example, if a company just hired a new CMO or if they're actively hiring a head of sales, maybe they just switched from Wix to Shopify. Depending on our service and what we sell, this can tell us a lot about the prospect and if we message people at the right time, we can hit their problems with solutions that are very relevant. That's why we call it a trigger. They do something, it tells us it's time to reach out. The next up we have is an indicator. An indicator is just something that they're doing that tells us a little bit of information we can use for context. For example, are they running Google ads? Are they running Facebook ads? Do they have Klaviyo installed? Do they have five sales reps? These could all be a indicator that they're a good or bad fit or that they're a right fit for a certain part of your product or solution. So we're looking at these just to provide more context to make our messaging resonate well. Next we have is title specific. Title specific is a great campaign if you're targeting very large organizations, normally hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands of employees. And this is where we reach out to different titles with different copy, because maybe we have a software product or a service, and it has 10 or 20 use cases, but not all of those use cases will matter to every person in a company. So we're gonna have slightly different messaging to different titles. And the way we keep our titles separated is by segmenting our lists. So for example, maybe the messaging is different for a CIO, a CTO, and a head of engineering, for example. Now, a pretty basic segmented campaign type, I see this a lot and it's I see it a lot because it works well, is case study based. This is where we have a very specific case study and we reach out to people that are similar to that case study because we can assume they care more about that case study than they would care just about anything else. For example, if you do Facebook ads for e-commerce brands and you have a women's swimsuit case study, it would make sense to reach out to women's swimsuit brands where if you show them a case study for a landscaping company you did lead gen for, they probably don't care. 
Now, second to last, we have personal connection campaigns. This is where we're reaching out to a prospect and we're mentioning something that connects us to them on a more personal, emotional level. This could be, hey, we're in the same city, or you're a skateboard brand. I grew up skateboarding, I love skateboarding. Just something to make you different on an emotional level from other people that are reaching out. Now, the final one here we have is lead source specific. This is where you're referencing where you found someone because you scraped them online. For example, I was watching your YouTube channel when you were sourcing leads from YouTube, or I read your article on Medium when you're sourcing leads from Medium. So it's just saying, I took you from here, this tells me these things, and I can reference it in my copy. Now, all of these lists are gonna be smaller than our broad campaign and take more work to maintain, but they will convert better percentage-wise. Now, over here, when we're looking at our broad campaign, this is exactly what it sounds like. It's a broad campaign. We'd still want it to be somewhat specific. We don't want it to be like all businesses in the world, but maybe if your target is e-commerce businesses, a broad campaign is like apparel e-commerce businesses. It's still somewhat segmented, but apparel is what? Tens of thousands of companies. So we can make sure it's running ongoing. And this is something where rather than having a lot of different sub campaigns, you have one core campaign, maybe a four or five variations of your script just for deliverability reasons. And you're going to send these out pretty much on a nonstop basis with the overall goal of volume, obviously maintaining deliverability, but the goal here is to send a lot of emails for this campaign. So now that we have the two campaign types covered, let's talk about the specific messaging within both. So for our segmented campaign, we are going to do a three email sequence. And for our broad campaign, we are going to do a two email sequence. Let's start with our two email sequence. Now, if you want a very in-depth guide on how to do this, I have one on my channel. Now, I'm not gonna go super in-depth for this video because I don't want this video to be two hours, but I will go high level through the contents of both of these emails. So we're gonna start off with a direct introduction. Because we don't have too much segmentation, we can only say something relatively generic as an introduction, or maybe even a high good morning. Next, we wanna address the pain point that we're solving. If you don't know your pain point, you need to go back and do more market research. You should also be rotating this pain point if you're not sure which one your market will resonate with most. This is a great way to add spin tax for deliverability while also doing split testing. Now, below our pain point we're addressing, we wanna tell them a solution. And if you have multiple solutions, you can split test them, or if you only have one solution, for example, your solution is Facebook ads, try different ways of phrasing it. Following that with a CTA, and we wanna split test here a value-based CTA, maybe sharing ideas or a video with um, competitor examples, a general interest, which is just saying, are you interested, and a hard CTA, which is for a meeting. If you want a full guide on CTAs, I also have it on my YouTube channel. Now, underneath this, we're gonna have our signature, ideally including a link for social proof, such as case studies or portfolio, and then an unsubscribe option. Now, for email two, we are going to send a brief recap of what it is that we do. For example, you know, re following up regarding doing Facebook ads for company name. We're then going to follow that with a case study. Our case study should only be one to two sentences. We're looking to name drop, ideally a well-known name. If you don't have it, do the best you can and we're going to explain very high level what the benefits they were and how they received them. Now, then I like to ask for another contact. For example, is there someone else at your company? Maybe Jim, and sometimes we'll even plug in that contact based on getting two contacts from every company. We then recap our signature, our CTA, our signature, and we also have a unsubscribe option, and that's the sequence. Now, I repeat this every five to seven months to the same people because at that point, unless they've unsubscribed, they've probably forgotten who you are and there's no harm in emailing them again. Now, moving on to our segmented campaign, the first two emails are gonna be pretty similar. The biggest difference here is the introduction on email one is going to be based on the segment and also the pain points and solutions should be tied to the segment. For example, if we sell sales consulting and they're hiring a head of sales, well, we can provide that context into the pain points they may be having for when, because they need that position, as well as an introduction in terms of how we found them. So make sure you contextualize around the segment. Again, there's more on this on my channel, but that is what we do. Now, email two is pretty much the exact same thing as email two over here for the broad campaign. However, email three, I do an extra email here because these lists are generally more work to build, cost a bit more, and I wanna get more 
juice out of a squeeze here. So what I like to do is do an intro to a case study. For example, I like to give a quick brief onto a similar company we helped. It does need to be a similar company. Include the case study, have a CTA related to the case study, which is normally, do you want to see more about how this worked? Do you want to see how this worked for X and it can work for you? Do you want to see the ads that worked? Something related to the case study. I have my signature and an unsubscribe option. So that is my sequence. And I'm going to repeat that again every five to seven months, excluding unsubscribe contacts. Now, ideally here, we get a lead, a lead being a positive response. Now, as a quick intermission, if this sounds complicated or you'd like to speed up this process and back your tests on real data, you should check out Grow B2B. It's my consulting and coaching program teaching agency owners and B2B businesses how to build the same outreach systems that we do for our main clients as well as our own business. There's a link in the description if you wanna learn more. Now, once I get a lead, as in a positive reply, one thing I always do is I add that prospect on LinkedIn. Now, compared to other social media channels, LinkedIn has really great reach. And what that means is when I post content, a large majority, or at least a larger majority of my audience will see it as opposed to platforms like Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. So there's really no reason you shouldn't be adding these people who've just responded positively on LinkedIn. It's almost like building up an email list where whenever you post, someone who's previously opt-in or shown interest in your services is going to see it. So I don't do any messages, I just simply connect with them. And I also try to connect with other people who might be involved in the decision-making process. For example, if I had a lead from a co-founder, I will go ahead and connect with both co-founders or also the CMO or head of sales, anyone related to my decision-making process. Now, I try to post on LinkedIn, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm not the most consistent, but what I try to do is once a week, and the content I post is generally based around observations. So what I'm seeing in my market, stories, these are generally stories of how I fix problems, tutorials, I do these as photo sliders, case studies, or also direct CTA posts. Now, this is by no means a full breakdown of how to do content in LinkedIn, but that's generally what I do. Now, in terms of actual appointment setting, this is where I think most people go wrong, and it can actually be quite tricky to take someone from a lead to a book call. So I'm gonna go ahead and break down how I send the initial message, as well as my follow-up sequence for if somebody stops responding to me. Now, for my first response to someone, I wanna make sure I'm answering the same day, ideally within an hour or two. If you need to set up a zap for notifications on your phone or whatever it may be, do that. This is quite important and speed really does matter. Now, the first thing I do is I answer the question fully. So if someone asks me a question or I offer to send more information, I do not deflect to a meeting. This kills leads. You need to answer fully and contextualize your message and how it relates to their business and given your expertise. Your goal is to show that you are competent and creative. Now, if you need more help on this, I have a whole video on appointment setting on my channel, but the main thing here is do not templatize this and make it basic. You have put all this work in to get a lead. You need to give them a proper opportunity to convert. Now, next thing I do is I suggest a time after I've answered to discuss further. I either like to ask for their calendar and send mine as a backup or suggest a time that works for them. Now, I know a Calendly link is convenient, but especially in slightly older generations, it's considered rude and overall, this converts much better if you're not pushing directly to a calendar link. So once I've done that, Three days later, I will follow up and ask if a specific time works for them if they haven't answered. So for example, does Monday at 3 p.m. EST work for you? I sent you a tentative invite to hold it in case it does. So I do like to send back tentative invite to people. Now, if they still don't respond, five days later, I'll suggest if it's e they can suggest some times to meet. For example, hey, I know that Monday didn't work. What are any times you have that work Tuesday or Wednesday that you could suggest it might work? Now, if they still didn't answer that 10 days later, this is 10 days from the last message, I will ask if we're still trying to solve the problem tied to their CTA. So for example, if I was helping them book more calls with cold email, I would say, hey, first name, are you still looking to book more calls with cold email? Now, obviously I might add a little bit more depth to it, but that's the basis for this message. Now, 20 days later, we're getting to the point where people are pretty cold at this point. We're going to share a case study and recap a CTA. So we're gonna share a case study we previously shared or a new one and we're gonna recap the initial call to action that got them to respond and come a lead. Maybe it was to see a video or to look at ads that are working, whatever that is, you want to recap it. 
Now, at 50 days, we're at the point where this is pretty much a newsletter. So I'm no longer doing any personalization at this point. It's the same thing for everybody. Now, if you had different campaigns for different offers or businesses, obviously segment that, but that's about as far as I go here. So the first of these three emails I do is going to be sharing an industry insight. So for example, in the B2B lead gen industry, I'll share an insight or a new trend that's happening that may be interesting to them. 50 days after that, I like to do a reintroduction and service recap email. This might be something like, hey, you might remember me, but I'm Michael, I do cold email for B2B companies, here's what I do, blah, 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 are you interested? And 50 days after that, I send a ongoing interval. So what that looks like is this is just an ongoing sequence where I send a case study in one email, an insight in another, and a recap in another. And it just goes on and on and on and on. And at this point, often I'll even put people in a tool like Active Campaign, because by no means am I sending them personal messages or hand sending anymore. Now, a couple additions to this that I often do are holiday messages. If they're from the US, I'll send them like a Christmas or a New Year's message. Um, New Year's message tends to be the best one, uh, at least in my industry. And also if there's ever a big industry change, this could be like a Facebook ads update or a deliverability update for doing cold email or whatever it may be. If there's a big industry change, sometimes that will justify a message to my entire list of people that have become a lead but have not booked a call. And that's pretty much my appointment setting process. Now. If you do have the opportunity to send someone your calendar to book them on, which you not, might not always have, I like to send them an embedded booking page. For example, here is mine. It's dfymeetings.com slash book dash a dash call, which by the way, you can book a call if you wanna work with me. Um, but why do I send them this? Well, one, it looks really professional. Two, I have a pixel for retargeting. And three, they can see other things on my website. For example, I want them to go and look at all of my testimonials or all my case studies. These things make me look good. So if I can get them into my infrastructure, even better. So that's just a little trick when it comes to actually booking a meeting where if you have an opportunity, it certainly helps. Now, I won't go into depth here, but it is worth noting that I do run retargeting ads of Google and Meta. I spend about $5 a day on each. And even if someone has already become a customer, I think it's just good reinforcement. So there's really no reason not to do this. And because you're collecting these people on your booking page, just go ahead and run it, even if it's a dollar a day. Now on the actual calendar that's embedded on your page, or even if you're sending a Calendly or Tidy Cal link directly, there are a couple things that are worth noting that I see people doing wrong. Now keep in mind this person, to this person you're still a stranger and they don't trust you entirely. So I recommend don't ask questions that an employee can't answer about permission. For example, if you're targeting CMOs or head of digital marketing or whatever, and you have to ask like, what is your exact revenue and profit? Well, maybe they're not permitted to say, and a lot of times if they're not permitted to say, they just won't book. Also, don't ask more than four to six questions. We want it to be easy to work with you and not require a lot of thinking. We also don't want to ask questions that require tons of advanced thinking, like what are your exact stats for this, 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 and that. Now I get it, it would make your sales process better, but we're reaching out to someone asking for their time, we want to be respectful of that. And finally, don't add ego messages. I see this a lot where if you no-show me, I'll block you. Obviously no-shows suck, and I'll show you some solutions to that, but don't add these messages, they just make you look silly. Now once someone's booked, I also do a pre-meeting sequence. And this is pretty simple. It's two emails and one text. And I send these messages through Calendly. They have an option to set up email and text reminders. This is where I do that. Now, email one, I send them a confirmation for their appointment, a summary of what we're gonna cover on the call, and a link to see my case studies. Pretty basic. Email two, I send them a reminder that we're having a call, I re-emphasize the things we're going to cover, and I also share more case studies or a resource. In my case, I normally share a YouTube video as a resource. And finally, the day of the call, I send a text reminder, and finally, a link to another case study or resource. The whole idea here is just to build trust and familiarity with a prospect before they actually talk to you. Now, at this point, we've gone from outreach to appointment setting, all the way down here to getting someone on our calendar. It's probably a lot more steps than you were thinking. I mean, this is a good bit of work. So now, what do we do if someone doesn't show up? Because obviously that's really frustrating, but I hate to tell it to you, it's going to happen. So if someone does not show up to the call, the first question I ask is, do I have their phone on Calendly or whatever booking form I use? If yes, I call them. And if they don't answer, I leave a voice note. I just say who I am, we need to schedule time, and I'm looking forward to talking to them. Let me know when the time's better. Now, if there's no answer, 
I add them on LinkedIn or I see if they have LinkedIn. If they don't, I text them. If they do, I message them on LinkedIn. Now, if I don't have them on LinkedIn, I will text them this little sequence. I will ask if they're still able to meet. And then a few hours later, I'll see if there's a better time the same day. And then two days later, I will ask if it's still a project they're looking on. Now, I will also do text and email in my follow-ups, but you could just do one or the other if you want. So this is what I'm going to do if somebody does no-show me, which again, is frustrating, but it will happen. So now, and this is what we want to happen, people to show up to the call. So they show up to the call, we do our discovery, and then I like to send people a proposal either the same day or the next day. The proposal is a great opportunity for you to show your competence, creativity, and ideas, and especially if you're selling to an organization where there's multiple decision makers, this proposal is something that your point of contact can share onwards and upwards to get further approval and release your payment. So in my proposal, a couple of things that I like to do is I like to make sure it's attached to a page with a custom domain. For example, it'd be like yourdomain.com slash prospect domain. And I like to put it on this page because it looks really professional and clean. I also like to make sure I'm breaking down all the deliverables and timeline, what exactly someone's gonna get and how long it's going to take them. I also like to add emphasis on what it's like to work together. What quality assurance points do we have? Where do we communicate? What days are we available? Who are you gonna be working with? And then I also share examples that I shared in the call. So on the call, if I gave them certain campaign ideas, I put them in a proposal as well so they can really envision themselves working with me. Now, I also list what's needed from them, pricing and payment options, next steps, and then I also, of course, add social proof. And in my case, it's case studies, reviews, testimonials, resources, PR, companies we've worked with, and even our partner certifications. For example, we're at Instantly and a Smart Lead Partner. So I'm adding as much as I can here to get them to trust us. Now, if things go smooth, they respond, you go through some logistics, you have a contract invoice, you're making money, and now you're driving a Lamborghini Huracan down South Beach Road. Now, this doesn't always happen. So if they haven't responded in 48 hours, I will call them and leave a voice note. If they don't answer, I will again look on LinkedIn. If yes, message on LinkedIn. If not, I will text. Now, I will then after that do a combination of email and text follow-up. First email is I just ask if they have any questions on the proposal. Then I will text to ask them any questions on the proposal. Email two, I will propose a time to meet and discuss the proposal. Email three, I ask if there's a better time to meet. Email four, I'm just generally asking for a timeline of this project, because if it's a large project, which in the case of myself where I sell big projects, sometimes the sales process can be months. And then finally, I ask them if they're still working on this project. Now, if they've ghosted me at this point, often I'll just go back up here and throw them in my 50 day sequence. So even if somebody goes through the whole process and ghosts me, I'm still gonna keep following up with them because unless they've told me specifically not to, there's no reason to stop. And when you zoom out, you see it's a pretty big process, but this is what has worked well for me. And if you wanna go even more in depth, make sure you check out Grow b 2 b my consulting and coaching program showing you the exact things I'm doing for myself and my clients, and even for a few of these, there's extra videos on my YouTube channel. So if you wanna check those out, make sure to subscribe and check them out on the channel. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video.